Um, so I'm delighted to introduce Deirdre Brennan, Head of Children's for ABC Television. Hello. Um, Hello. Sherry Botcher, who is Head of Children's Television Network 10. Uh, Lisa Sather, GM, Branded Media, oh, sorry, Branded Media Content, Disney Channel. Uh, Steve Viner, CEO and Executive Producer, Liquid Animation. And brave man. <laughs> and very brave man for being here with all these women. Um, and Suzanne Ryan, who's the CEO and Executive Producer for SLR Productions. So, um, so we've heard yesterday a lot about multi-platform, second screens, um, and you know, obviously how it's impacting what, um, what sort of, you know, how, how we're viewing. Um, so of course, it's really going to be particularly relevant in the kids space because of course, you know, we're all struggling, but they're just innate. They know how to use it and it's part of what they do. It's their fabric. Um, so I'd like to throw to you, Lisa, because you've got some research to show us mm -hmm. and to talk through. Yeah, hi guys. Can you hear me? Oh, because I've got clickers and microphones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try this one. Would you like me to hold? Oh, thanks. <laughs> it's a, it's a yeah, combined effort here. Let's just see if we can get this up. Is that slide coming up? Well, do I need to move my head? <laughs> no, it's coming. Um, just as, as way, by way of background, we've got the three channels here, Disney, um, Disney channels. So it's Disney Junior, which is our preschool channel, uh, and then Disney Channel, which is really focusing on that inspiration and um, music and star talent, and I guess classically kind of what Disney um, is known for. And then recently we've launched Disney XD, which is more that action, thrilling, adventure, um, you know, randomness, um, and a real sense of kind of edgy humour that's coming through. So we've got those two channels that really target that tween audience. Um, and I'm, well, as you'll see here with some of the research that we've got, I'm going to focus now just on that, that audience. So this is really isn't such a, a preschool um, a preschool view. So if we click forward, yes, here. So the first slide that's just coming up is really just indicating probably something that we, we all know, really. Um, and this is, uh, was a survey that we undertook with about 1,200 homes. Um, and it's, as I said, focused on kids or families, households with kids between 7 and 14. And this, the question here was really, you know, what devices are kids mainly using? So TV's clearly coming out number one there. Computer's really well behind, um, you know, just, just behind it there. And as you can see, the, the DV pieces, they're, um, that's about portable DV players. Gaming consoles, the tablets, as you would expect. The tablets number is really interesting because when you do dive deeper into the whole tablets area, kids really actually have ownership of the tablets in the household. So whether they actually, it's been bought for them or not, 40% of families say, yeah, it's the kid's tablet. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's at the end of the day there. Um, and as we can see too here, the hours that they're watching is actually increasing. Um, so, you know, we've got seeing about three hours more of content than last this time last year and, and 20 hours more than actually even in that older kind of age bracket. So as I said, this is kind of going up to that 14. Um, the next slide here just shows then about the, I guess, proliferation of devices that we're seeing. Um, and so there is certainly... Um, you know, with the introduction of so many different platforms that kids viewing is, is actually, you know, moving around um, across a whole different different number of platforms there. You can see there, this is where people um, have regularly viewed content, or families view, consider their kids, again, between this age group, have regularly viewed content, TV and movie content. Um, so 31%, you know, have viewed content over the last week on a tablet, um, you know, just behind that um, laptop there of 32%, and then again there with 46% um, up on the portable devices. So, strong story there in terms of what the enablement, I guess, of new devices is enabled for households. Um, two, just remembering too, with households with kids, um, we really over-index in terms of the number of devices. Um, and you know, uh, with, ha with households with young kids, about 68% of them have these uh, have you know uh, tablets, and with smartphones, it's 87%. So again, over-indexing. If we just move on to the next one, which I am controlling somehow. <laughs> Um, yep, okay, here. Um, and then what we, we wanted to really look at is this multi-screen piece and what's actually happening while they're watching TV um, and how they're actually, you know, engaging in these other devices. And I think, you know, we've all been feeling that, oh, this, you know, second screen experience is very much going to be that companion experience. But we're not actually really finding that so much. Is they still like to chill out and watch TV and have that kind of lean back piece. But they're active as well. But it's not necessarily actively involved in that content at the same time, which is an, is an interesting evolution. I think we found. So you know, 18% of them um, are really are, you know just watching TV without actually under undertaking anything else. But that 82% there, this is what they're doing. So they're they're using the tablet, music devices, smartphones, and in this age bracket, often just chatting, um, which is you know I, I, I guess not surprising, but. I, 
doesn't mean that the content extensions that we'll talk about a bit later aren't valid, but they're just not necessarily being consumed at the same time as, as the actual um, you know, television shows, so to speak. Um, and this is really what's coming through here in terms of, you know, it's not necessarily a compatible screen experience at that same point in time. Um, and then I just really wanted to show, to talk about, I guess, the, the essence of great content for kids. It still really is a balance um, between quality content and good stories and good characters. I mean, you know, they are consuming so much in the YouTube space and they're seeing so much user-generated content, but when they're actually going to a, a brand like ours, they're expecting that real quality storytelling to come through. They're expecting to, um, you know, have that sense of, of tension and that sense of hyper-excitement, so they're looking for that drama piece too coming through. Um, but what they really want is something that's actually they can call out and can see, they can identify with, and those um, kind of real real life experiences. Um, and that's that's really important for us in, when, in, then in terms of what how we're marketing our content and making, for us anyway, our international show is really relevant to our local kids through some local content. And that comes through here. Um, I just wanted to talk here about how the content really needs to live outside the moment, which is you know, further to my point before in terms of it's important to have content on these multiple screens, but it actually has to extend beyond that actual initial experience or consumption of the show. So it's kind of what they can do with it, how they can create that talkability around it, take it into the schoolyard, um, and, and really you know, keep, it, keep it alive, I guess, and keep that, as I was mentioning, that hyper-excitement piece. Um, Catherine, we have that example of Hanging With. Do you want me to just go straight to that and talk about that? What we've done... Hanging with is, a, is an afternoon block that we've got on our Disney Channel, and it's you know it's not um, you know, new stuff. You know, you've seen many hosted blocks around afternoons for kids shows. Um, we hadn't had one for a while, and we brought it back last year. And these are just some of the comments in connection with Hanging With, and I will show you a little sizzle of it. Um, but it's two local kids that, as I said, after school hosting links around our shows, and they just have funny skits. Um, you know, they're kids that, they're young kids that our fans can actually identify with and we're able to actually create some short form content within in this block so that we can then take it onto YouTube or our, our online piece. So it's kind of breakout little sits, um, set, sit choose. Um, and also what we can do there too is actually call out kids to communicate back. So there's that fan engagement again and we have online posts where they, you know, actually talk about what, you know, Naomi and Adam did that afternoon and, and we're able to keep that interaction going and again it takes it back into the schoolyard. Um, so yeah, I think probably if we just roll to the, to the tape here, which again I'm in control of, so hopefully I can make happen. Yeah. Hey dudes, good to have you hanging with us this Arvo. Welcome to Wednesday, gringos. Well, we've had another onesie change. Giraffe. But hey, Tommy Gong should be in next for dude food. Hey, where is that guy anyway? Should we call him? Oh, hey there, brothers and sisters. I hope you guys are ready for one of the gnarliest dude food experiences ever with me, Tommy Gong. <laughs> Linda from Life Hacks is popping by for a little visit. Oh. Hello there. Welcome to Life Hacks with the lovely Linda. Today I'm going to show you how a little bit of colour coordination can not only give you so much needed pizzazz. You're going to like the request from Chloe in South Australia. I'd love to see you guys act out a Wizards of Waverly Place scene. I'd love Naomi to be Alex and Adam to be Mason. Let's do it. Here's a scene I found for us. We should run. No. no. We should have a romantic montage. Oh. It's the segment we all know and love, but with a twist of next step goodness. Mm. Can we get a split screen, please? Welcome back to Extreme Excellent and Extreme Workout with Chuck Davis. Extreme! 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 We're gonna learn a move I call the Extreme Sidekick Double Action Swoop Arm Squat. But you can just call it the Excadasis. Here I am in LA having an adventure and first off in Hollywood. Hey guys, I'm at the Frozen premiere here at the El Capitan Theatre in Los Angeles. Hello, Jonathan. Hi. Do you prefer summer or winter? Winter all the way. Look where we are! Hong Kong 
Disneyland Main Street, USA. Oh. I'm Naomi, princess in training. This is Adam. More like the beast if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You're waiting for some pumpkin and for some drunken. Mm -hmm. Sometimes turn off the TV. Go outside and just be free. Completely real, true nature. So, um, the Savo, we're ditching our skateboards for surfboards. But don't worry, it's only temporary. Hey guys, good to have your company. And if you think we look redonkulous, that's because we do. This whole green screen idea thing was an awesome idea. Should we end on a high five? Always. Yeah! Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it really is about making the shows relevant for our kids and being where they are. And, and this series has enabled us to take you know, our content beyond the channel and onto you know, these other platforms. So, yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's always good to have some research, um, particularly when you know, we don't often have that um, access to that. So, you know, um, thank you for sharing with that. So I'd like to bring in our free to air, both commercial and ABC broadcasters now, just to really talk about with all of those multi-screens, um, you know, and kids going to other places, how is that impacting you? And what are you having to, I guess, to do to sort of ensure that you're capturing and keeping kids? <laughs> <laughs> this is alphabetical order, isn't it? Um, it's quite funny, because now I've been back at ABC for six months, but uh, I, I'm delighted to say that in a way, uh, our headspace is not in a, a traditional linear broadcaster. Uh, it happens to be our most successful platform at the moment, but when we're thinking about what ABC looks like in 2017 and 2020, it's very much driven by the other opportunities that we have. There are some challenges for the public broadcaster. We service uh, and provide content for two to 14 year olds and that's a really broad age range. And each uh, demographic has its own sort of uh, ways of engaging with content and places that they're engaging with content. We were talking about this earlier. Um, we've seen quite a significant decline in the online content for ABC for Kids. But at the same time, you can imagine iView usage, and I'm not going to mention the P program word, but uh, is just boing phenomenal. Boing. <laughs> it's just driving extraordinary engagement of the content. And I don't really care whether it's on iView or on the linear channel, because when we make content, we have to think about the release strategy for that content. At the moment, the, the linear channel is the most important flat platform. But you can see, particularly in preschoolers, that our online usage, because it's not mobile device friendly, is in rapid decline. It's not just something gradual, it's like, whoa, down that hill. Uh, so we're currently uh, undertaking a project to transfer all our existing content and new content into, uh, a, obviously, a mobile-friendly space. Should have really done that three years ago, but uh, I think yesterday we all got the, the real feeling and sense that things change so quickly, but we're, we're really in catch-up mode at the moment. For older kids, we're still exploring ways of uh, providing content. Uh, that they want in different places. Uh, I mentioned a, a great UGC site we have called RAW, R-A-W-R. Some of you may not know about it, but it's where kids make films and share their films and develop uh, skills and, and we give them new tools. The one big disconnect with that great initiative that was launched last year, they don't show them on the linear channel. And, uh, and we're moving to change that obviously in, in coming months, but once we create that circle where uh, the work and Australian kids are finding a platform for their artistic expression on our linear channel, I can see that exploding. Because we stop being a platform talking to them, we become their platform that they can own. And, and I think that's something very small that will make the world of difference. And I think that will start connecting to sort of particularly 10 to 14 year olds, probably more than we do currently. Great, thank you. And Sherry, would you? Uh, in the commercial free to airs, we very much, uh, when projects come in, we have to think about all those multi screens. Uh, in March, um, we launched 10 Play Kids. Now it's very, very new, so we're still experimenting with it. We're talking to um, Beyond Home um, Division, Entertainment Division, about working together to get. Um, cartoons and programs that we can show on 10 Play Kids rather than on the linear television. So the kids are getting something a little bit extra. Our social, we've gone very much into the social networking side of things. Um, 
and with um, a lot of the multi-screens as far as digital is concerned. As Lisa said, tablets are so very important. And what drives, we're finding, is driving the eyeballs to the website are the competitions. Mm. We have, um, especially with Toasted TV, we have a very big competition base and that seems to drive the kids to that. Um, Channel 11 is our kids' TV block and we have a lot of different genres on that. Um, I would love to have whole channels, but <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. Being a commercial broadcaster, um, we very much rely on advertising and that's where our revenue comes from. And it's a tough world out there. Mm. Well, one of the things that is interesting, because obviously you're not just looking at traditional linear, um, you know, and being able to use the content in that space, how is it that you can actually then, from a rights point of view, um, you know, you needing to sort of play it on catch up in, you know, all these different spaces, how is that, how important are the rights um, for programs? Um, you don't want me to start, do you? Because I won't stop. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get in because, yes. <laughs> uh, the rights are really important, but you don't want to exploit your independent producer because in some areas that's the only way that they can get something back from the product. You'll never make um, a fortune out of just making film for linear television. Um, it's working together with the independent producer and sharing those rights. I have a lot of kids that actually complain that a lot of programs aren't on catch-up and the reason they're not on catch-up is because we don't have the rights. So it's very much a 360 these days work and working with the independent producer on how we can share those rights. Can I maybe bring the independent producers into the story about that and how is it for you in terms of... Be nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just going to say that... Oh, they pick up. They can... Hi. No, it doesn't matter. I can speak out loud. Um, I was just going to say from, our, from my perspective, um, the right situation for us that's um, quite um, difficult is that we often can't buy out rights when we're making a show. So... We can't buy out um, voice actors for our cartoons and um, therefore that means we can't deliver um, a number of plays to the network. So we're stuck in a very old um, traditional model of only being able to deliver six runs which then the network can only play and then they have to re-license from us which we have to re-license from the actor and that, that becomes quite a frustrating model but if you were co-producing, um, which I'm sure people in the audience are aware of co-producing when you're working with another country, if they bring voice actors um, as they're part of their, their piece of making the show with you, um, they actually can bring um, a buyout of runs and then therefore we can deliver that so it can go on to um, iView and it can go on to um, different channels here. It, it fe feels to me a bit like a bolt-on because having come from seven years in pay television because of when pay developed, the, the, the flexibility of what you do with content is so much greater purely because of the time frame. So the structures we're working within, if I wanted to be able to do a, a different release strategy for kids because I think a, a, a digital or an iView launch was going to be more effective to, st to build vibe, to try and get that lead up, um, I cannot do it under my terms of trade, I'm not permitted to. Yeah, I so think it's really difficult because the consumer doesn't know about no. it. It's the fans out there wanting it. Yeah, so, we'd, yeah. we'd love to experiment a lot more with storytelling and, mm -hmm. and uh, it, unless we produce them in-house, we can't work with an independent producer because it, you know, their hands are tied as well. So th there's great challenges, but we desperately need all of us as a community to work together to catch up because if we don't, Australian content will suffer. Um, can I also then um, expand it now to a case study on Sam Fox, which is production that was done between SLR Productions and Channel 10. Would you like to talk about how that came to be so people can understand kind of sure. how you put together a big international <laughs> co-production? <laughs> well, first of all, I was going to say yesterday when I was listening to some of the sessions, I was really excited by listening to 
people speaking about gaming content mm. and um, in our model at SLR, we've traditionally always um, taken um, a book property or um, a, a design or a property that a creator has come to us with and we've adapted that to a television model and um, I can really see, you know, such a great synergy that we can work with the gaming industry and, and look at taking that into um, a TV model or vice versa. But Sherry and I, <laughs> I've got two versions of one book here. So this was a book property that um, um, Penguin, the publishers, pitched to um, us at, at SLR knowing we like to do book properties and I pitched this to Sherry, I did the math this morning, in 2008. We went into production in January 2013 and it's going to air next month on the 20th of July, so on Channel 11 at 11am. Um, so that gives you a bit of an indication on how long something does take. But this book property um, came with 12 books. We had a discussion at it at a conference just like this, which is really great to go to these things and try and make a meeting with somebody that you can talk to. And then we went into a scripting process and a pilot, like a proof of concept. And then we had to look at trying to finance it because just between Sherry and um, myself, we couldn't make the show. It's, you know, it needs a lot of different partners involved. And so what came from that was um, we had Cartoon Network and we had ZDF Enterprises in Germany um, on board the project. And then we were able to collaborate with um, um, the Adelaide Film Commission, uh, the SAFC, I'm getting myself mixed up, a bit like Screen Queensland, but based in Adelaide, and then the tax credits that we can bring to a show because it's a 26 half hour drama. Um, if we fast forward, like just talking about just, you know, this is my little world. Would you like to? Yeah, show let's show the clip. Oh, no, that's the wrong one actually, sorry. Yep. That's the right one. No. <laughs> There's oh. one on there just called Sam Fox trailer. Sorry. We might have to just keep going. And yeah, then and then you can find it. Later. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will see the trailer. <laughs> yes, we will see the trailer. I was just going to say, so then the publisher now has republished um, the same book property, but it's got a tie-in, so it has now the images from the series, and that's out in um, bookstores now, and that's the way that, you know, we, I guess what we call a traditional model, we haven't made a game version of our show. We've made a website that will launch, and um, so we're a very traditional model um, at our company. And we will complement that website by having it on Template Kids as well. Also, because we do so many productions in-house, we are able to promote the launch of Sam Fox as well as... Um, publicise, do a lot of publicity around it before it actually gets to air. And so that's working in collaboration with your independent producer and I think it, that's how it tells the real story. Yeah. Um, I think we're almost ready. Yep. Nope. Can I ask Sherry a question? And you Suzanne? Yes. Um, live action production seems to be shrinking in this wonderful land of ours. Is, is it hard to finance a, a series such as Sam Fox? It is all to do with cost. Mm. Um, I can only speak on behalf of Network 10. I can't speak for the other commercial broadcasters. But I think it's so important out there for Australian kids to still hear Australian stories. Okay. And live action is so important um, as far as I'm concerned. But once again, it is a cost thing, budgets, you know, the whole economy of Australia is unfortunately um, not in great shape. And you've, you know, your, your state screen bodies and your federal screen bodies all are trying to help, but they're suffering budget cuts as well. Mm. So it's about sitting together with somebody 
like Suzanne and just working out how we can cut that pie a little bit differently. It might be the broadcaster supply the resources and that's one way of um, having a release to the bottom line of that budget. Yeah, and just to add in, I guess from our point of view, subscription television clearly a very different business model, but it's still important for us to try and work here with um, you know you guys, producers, independent producers out here, as obviously well as the, um, ABC public broadcasters and um, Sherry and the other commercial broadcasters, and we can take second windows on content. Um, and again, you know, to Sherry's point, it's really important for us to have local kids and a local you know voice on that channel, which is why we've you know gone down the route we have with things like Hanging With that I showed you. But you know, long form you know, local content contents is equally important. Can I, can I just um, then also expand that now and include you, Steve? Sure. <laughs> Save the best for last, shall we? Um, would you like to talk about then other fun funding models that you've sort of been exploring and talking about some of the um, other ways that you've um, looked to finance and also what you have, the sort of experiences mm -hmm. you're now having also in the Asian marketplace as well? Sure. Particularly um, as it relates to D Dumpling Brothers. Yeah. I think... Um, the traditional model is still, you know, valid, but it's very, you know, hard. That's where if you try to finance, for example, a 26 half-hour TV show and get an, an Australian broadcaster and, and a co-production um, partner and then a distributor and maybe another um, another um, broadcaster, like as you're saying, ZDF or something like that, it's, it is, it's still valid there, but it's very hard as a producer. I think it's... it's um, so what we're really doing is, as well as looking at that model, is looking at the alternative funding that's there as well. And that really um, you know, comes into the other media content that you can actually validly say it's you know, content to finance and it actually has a revenue stream. And that's when you look at um, like games, for example. And with a, a show at the moment, um, The Dumpling Brothers, which has a, a big focus into China because that's a, um, an enormously it, it's a growing market for us um, in terms of the animation uh, production companies that are that are there and also the um, the broadcasters and everything really wanting to reach out and to, to partner with Western Studios. So currently now, I mean, that's for, for the Dumpling Brothers, it's very much from a, um, a, a financing model. It's having traditional um, broadcasters and distributors, but also having investment from um, other players, like in in, in um, China, for example, as well as um, Toon Max and SMG is bringing in like uh, Tencent, which is one of the, the big internet companies who want to invest in the show and can also get it out to a, a massive audience. So it's, it's looking at those different um, layers of financing that actually enables us to look at the, the show and finance the show, not only as a television show, but also to um, finance the games and bring in other revenue streams. We actually see that the, the gaming revenue will start to come to us before the, the television revenue and actually provide um, a, a direct return right now. I mean, if, yeah. you look at, if you look at TV as an independent producer, really, yeah. you don't make money out of the TV show and you'll only make money if it really gets into a second or third run and, and gets licensing and merchandising and a mm -hmm. consumer product. And that's, that's pretty rare out there. I mean, it's, you either create a SpongeBob or something like that or else you literally get a show and as producers all we're doing is working for production fees and not earning that sort of IP royalty that is the, the ongoing thing that we want to, to create to, have, to really have a sustainable business. Otherwise, you're just going from one show to the next. So it's with um, the dumpling, as I said, I mean, we can start with the games production, move that out, really have that into the market in nine or 12 months, have revenue coming through there. The TV uh, series will take like 18 months to to come through. Um, so it's, it's sort of that where it provides financing opportunities but also direct revenue opportunities. You know, now we see it as well as, as well as um, just, as well as hopefully the licensing and merchandising down the track, it's another really valid revenue stream for us to get, to get gaming revenue. And we, we quite honestly see that as, uh, we'll make more money out of the, the game side of the program than the, um, than the television side. Um, Steve, and how much would you invest in a game that, that is a property you're going to develop into television? Um, into a ballpark? Well, if you look at the dumpling, we've got the TV, and we're, it's 26 11s, and then we've got um, 
three games and a, a restaurant simulator game. So it's sort of three, uh, we've got Slice and Dice, um, Paddy Whack, and then we have um, the Kamikaze Dumplings. So it's sort of three games that will launch over three months and then the Imperial Restaurant, and it's sort of a restaurant simulator where you, you build your own restaurant. You've got to go out in there and find the rare ingredients and then gradually build it up. So the proportion of that is probably about 25% of the, the TV budget. Like the television budget for 2611s will be about, around about $3 million. And on the game side, it will be probably about seven fifty for those for those four games that go mm -hmm. into it. So that's the financing, as well as just the TV side. We're looking at the other investment mm -hmm. for the games as well, and that's those other partners in in China that will come and invest in the whole sort of package to it. Um, and then, as I say, we can get the revenue out further. I mean, ultimately, it's trying to get to the feature film, mm -hmm. because in China, if you get the the TV market. Um, and you build a brand there, then a feature is a lot more successful that way. So it's really, you know, games, the TV, and then the, the feature film in, in two or three years. Yeah. yeah, and that's where we have a, um, I mean, the first thing is we can use the, the PDB, which is a, a government rebate um, to help finance the, the TV and also the, um, the games. And Screen Queensland. And Screen Queensland, <laughs> yep. And what about screen rights? Both? Do either of you use screen rights as a bit of a revenue base coming um, you back in? Screen rights is an organisation that actually can help you as producers. Um, so I'll just jump in just to give a bit of an explanation um, to look at secondary um, viewers, ships, etc., that you may not have known about, and they will capture all that information and, and um, make sure that there's. It's not, it's not substantial, but it's great incremental mm. amounts of money that pot potentially that you're not actually being able to exploit yourselves. And sometimes even the distribution companies that you work with are not doing that. So that's something that you as producers can actually contract with directly with screen rights. Um, and they have offices actually based in Sydney. Um, so that's a really good, um, good point of reference mm. for producers. Yeah. Yes, we, we do rely on screen rights, but now it's becoming um, more and more common that the distributor will um, want to take um, that money in order to recoup mm. their distribution advance. So um, we're finding more and more now we have to give that away. Right. We can only keep it. Shall we throw to the, sure. the dumplings, brothers? <laughs> Wise guy, huh? You need some special sauce. Your favorite. <laughs> hey, hey, welcome! I am here to show you. It's we! Okay, we! invite you to explore the amazing world of China. It's true cuisine, it's history, with me, with us. The oh, dumpling of us. Brothers. What was that? I thought that went pretty well. You lost your noodle? You deep fried me. It's supposed to be water. So sorry, you look a bit uh, crispy. Yeah? Was that my feeling? You look a bit thin. The Yangtze River. Today, I have been fishing for special Yangtze horse clams. Clams? Did I hear clams? So, you like clams too? So, let me help you, little one. Two is better than one. Oh, look what you're doing, no, no. You're sinking my little boat. Helping you. My clams? You're losing my special clams. What sort of crazy dumpling are you? You sink to the bottom of the walk all the time. Now you sink my boat. <laughs> Dicing and dicing, most important skill in your kitchen. Welcome back, friends. <laughs> you look a bit thin. <laughs> What's on the crazy dumpling aisle? Ah! You look a bit 
So I think, I mean, the great thing about animation, if you look at it, you can reuse the assets. I mean, that's the really cool thing that we can grab the assets and, and move them, you know, very easily. So it enables us to develop that, um, you know, the, the game and actually build that synergy in with the, the content. So it's not just a, an add-on. I think, you know, often you'll have a TV series and there it is and then there's a website and everything's an afterthought. Where really with this, we've, we've really planned it so that, the, the, the games work really well as a, as a, as a creative element. Um, it can work back within the, um, the production side of it so we can become more efficient in, in the production, reuse the assets and things. And also, obviously, as I said, the, um, the financing side, it, be, it can become a really viable element of the, the production budget to start with and then beyond that really complement the revenue streams that, that come through. I think that's a really good segue into talking about you know, marketing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and how that um, you can really sort of build fan based, um, yeah. you know, for your content. So, Suzanne, would you like to talk a little bit about that and, and also the broadcasters, if you'd like to come on board as well at any stage? We've, um, we've started to, uh, we have one uh, preschool show that we've um, started a second season on called um, Guess How Much I Love You and that has quite um, a large fan base and um, is an interesting fan base because the biggest fans are mums and so um, the mums are like if you don't know this in the children's world are probably the most powerful um, person behind your program and can have it taken off there or kept on there um, depending on how many mums they get behind but um, we have a lot of um, mummy bloggers or um, parent associations around the world that um, like to review um, our show and, and then they give it ratings or they talk about it. And, and so from that, lots of people are talking about the show and it gets awards or they put it up for different things. And so that's been um, one of the biggest eye-openers to, to us for a preschool show, um, more so than our other, our other shows. And then the, the fans from that is like each year there's a new fan base um, for it because you've got you know, newer, newer children, younger children <laughs> watching the show again. And um, so, yeah, for, for us, it's, it's mums that are the fans. I think uh, Sherry will probably agree with me that we don't get a lot of marketing resources for children's content in the free-to-air world. So we have to come up with other ways of uh, trying to create fan bases and communities around content. Um, the one thing I'm constantly telling my colleagues uh, in ABC is that it's not a first-run thing with kids. It yeah. could be a three year mm -hmm. or even in some cases, and I'm not going to mention the P word again with that, <laughs> but that show was brought in and on air since 2004 and now the Prime Minister seems to be a fan. <laughs> so you know, that's 10 years to get to that point. Bob the Builder, it took about five or six years to get to that point. So particularly in preschool, but uh, the hard challenge in older kids is to get that talkability and how we can provide a platform to give them exclusive insights or experiences or some sort of extension of that content that keeps that energy around a show. Nowhere Boys is a great example because that game has done more than just bring audiences to the initial plays. Um, it will help us continue to grow audiences over the next five years. I'll just um, jump in there too with a, a, actually a bit of a case study from a preschool property that Disney has launched. And of course, you know, massive big um, brand Disney being behind this property. But it was interesting that Doc McStuffins, a little character that's an, actually an African American doctor, got into a part of the community that Disney had no idea it was going to. And it became a phenomenal success because we basically um, got the attention of African American female doctors who were really supportive of this kind of role modeling piece. And it just, it took us by surprise, well, it took the international guys by surprise, we found out later. Um, and it just became a runaway success. And it was, you know, they're creating blogs, they were, you know, really creating a lot of PR around it that we just didn't you know, control. Luckily, it was positive, but um, yeah, we, it was really, it was phenomenal. So it was really exciting to see how that can come through with the community piece. Can I ask the panel a question? Oh, you may ask the panel a um, question. She really wants to be a moderator. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to be a moderator. Um, with social media, because you know, we face a challenge, because Facebook, you're not supposed to be on Facebook if you're under 13. 
Oh, so but we tell the regulator that it's the parents. I was just going to say, is there a way around that? <laughs> because to be honest, to ignore the fact that kids are using social media, particularly Facebook, is crazy. Well, you know, I, the marketing, as you say, you've got to generate it yourself. And Facebook is so very important mm -hmm. to, to all our productions. Um, in particular, things like with Scope, the science program. This science teaches very much put the word across in their Facebook with the schools and that generates, you know, the classroom chatter as well as the playground chatter. Um, with the international ones, like um, with Pac-Man, we had a, um, it was a bullying situation with one of the Pac-Man episodes. We were able to link that with state and federal agencies on their bullying no way campaign mm. and that was generated through the website and through all the social media as well so you just have to look and be very creative mm. Mm. we partner with those um that uh, agency as well too we're around mm. bullying on another program that we had that potentially um you know showed some well just showed yeah. some issues there and could have actually got some feedback from parents we wanted to be very proactive in that space and and make sure that they you know follow the program through to see the resolve which there was at the end yeah so as producers do you think you can also now start to launch your own content mm -hmm. do you need the broadcasters anymore no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that. <laughs> Be honest. Much longer. I, I would, you know, with all the IPTV and all mm. the internet platforms and um, the new set-top boxes that are available and all those sort of new um, technologies, um, it would be such a great um, way if you had a really big show that had a lot of fans that you launched it as its own channel and you controlled that. But I think just going and taking your library mm -hmm. and putting it on um, a YouTube channel is, may not kind of work. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think, Steve? I was going to say, I think um, you've still got to finance the show to start with. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, it comes back to that. If you look at the the broadcasters, the, the types of broadcasts are changing. Like Netflix is a broadcast now, Amazon, Hulu. These... Um, uh, digital uh, channels are becoming, you know, viable broadcasters, mm. and it's really what how we choose to finance the the show. We still need the broadcasters for obviously to build the audience and everything, but it's it's really critical from a a, um, a financing perspective for television. I mean, if you were just going games purely, then that's a different business model. But if you really what we're looking at is tying up the TV show and games and and having that more holistic approach, then the budgets are, uh, you know, big and you need the broadcasters. And with broadcasters, yeah. whether it's a traditional um, free-to-air or whether it's a, a Disney, a Nick or a Cartoon Network, and where we're in a lucky, where we are in a lucky space now, as well as the traditional broadcasters and, and those models and the, and the, the channels, we also have, um, you know, the Netflixes, the Hulus, the, mm. the Amazons, you've got Microsoft, Sony, they're all coming into this space too and wanting to build content so it actually provides more more avenues so it's actually quite a an exciting time as a producer now that you've got the traditional model but also these other areas of financing through those sort of the netflix example as as, as where it is or and also the gaming example so it's well, a we're currently um producing the second series of mako um down on the gold coast and netflix is one of the partners mm. for that um, so they're definitely very hungry yeah. for Australian product. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know quite amazing how how well it's been received. Mm. Yeah. But I think in answer also to that, Catherine, like we've we've recently been examining just as a legal point of view what constitutes broadcast um, and those and people who want to retain those rights and 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 you know we've been going back and forth on an agreement recently with a UK company. Um, where they won't allow us to have YouTube as um, a defined broadcast platform in our agreement. And so um, my legal team of having, we've been doing a lot of research on what defines broadcast and that YouTube is absolutely a um, valid broadcast platform for the future and that it would be very short-minded to keep that 
out of an agreement and quarantined. And so I think that you know technology and, and platforms and content is changing so quickly yeah. that we can't rule out anything right now. And um, it could just be a short form program of five minutes that is going to create all the fans in the world over a 26 half hour mm. traditional model. So I Can think I anything goes. YouTube, you should use an example. And, and it was in my first month back in the job. and. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought, oh, you know, we're going to have to consider YouTube as a funding partner and also yeah, a broadcast yeah. partner in future. It's already happened. So the CBBS in the UK is co-producing a, a really significant uh, preschool series with a, a very well-known partner, Sesame Workshop, um, and YouTube. So as a linear broadcaster, if we want to pick up that program, if we uh, continue to trade as a monopoly and go, well, we won't pick up that show if there's a, you know, an FOD partner, particularly in this part of the world, we wouldn't have a show. We wouldn't be able to access it. And obviously it's a, an appropriate program for the ABC because it's come from a public broadcaster. So in that case, we need to become a partner of choice um, for all of those uh, people involved in that show and say, yes, we can work with an FOD launch in the territory and then come onto a linear platform. Yeah. Because no one, everybody goes, oh, you can't do that. But I think no one really knows the impact of what that would mean for right. building the audience for the program. Mm. I like to think it could actually help, mm. but we honestly don't know. But it's here already, so I'm it's having those discussions already. as yeah. we speak and more going. more children are on oh. YouTube. Yeah. And I yeah. can't yeah. cut them out because <laughs> they're a funding partner. So I have to treat them with respect. So you say you are changing, yeah. Deirdre, to look at these different windows yes, and things absolutely. like that? Yes, absolutely. In the midst of that yeah. is quite a good Because the feature work. film, it's had to do it as well. The whole windowing cycle True. in feature films has, has um, changed. Yep. Toasted yeah. TV have their own YouTube stuff, mm. but internationally there's a lot of big animation companies, um, for example Hasbro, they actually have the hub, yeah. it's their own channel, yeah. so you know, Which it's is a happening. partnership with Discovery. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're going to throw um, to Sam Fox and a couple of other things, um, and then um, we're going to open it to questions. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, we'll leave it. Okay. We've got a technical difficulty. Right. <laughs> Number one rule, always double check. I didn't double check, and it's the wrong trailer on the USB stick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then we'll open, we'll open up to some questions. Any, any questions? Oh, are we showing it? Yeah. 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 It's Sam Fox is in it though, isn't it? Oh, no, okay. it's is there any questions yeah. from the audience? It doesn't matter. Okay, um, just waiting for some microphone. <coughs> Hello. Um, my question is about whether or not when you are creating content for children, the fact that you have to consider marketing and you have to consider all the factors that go around funding, whether or not it has an in integral part in, in assessing what is good quality and what is not good quality. So are we changing the models of what is good for our kids who are under five to look at? Mm. Is it being changed because of business? Or mm. am I optimistic and, and silly for thinking that was never the case all along. Um, I, sorry, I don't think, ma as a commercial broadcaster, I don't think marketing comes into the decision mm. because, um, you know, internally we have our own marketing and publicity and promotion, so I wouldn't include that in my decision on whether to commission or acquire programming. Mm. And back-end participation is obviously completely relevant to the ABC. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas in, in my pay life it would have actually been a consideration if the show was great, if yeah. the concept was great, but not because it wouldn't be the decision-making factor. Yeah. I think you still, you still want to make a great show. Yeah. I mean the different funding alternatives or the different screens, they're there, but it doesn't affect that core you know, the core story and what you create and, you know, that real passion to make a, a great show. So that doesn't fundamentally change at all. We've just got more options that where we can finance it or, or show it. Yeah. Mm. And with that too, we've got so many different more options around marketing. Marketing in itself for shows now has changed so much mm. because we really are relying on a, a sense of advocacy and, you know, that fan base, building yeah. up those fan bases and the talkability, you know, across all genres really because whether it's for preschool with parents and mums or whether it's with mm. tweens and, you know, that schoolyard chatter, that's where your real marketing is going to come through if it's the right show. That's why Peppa is now like the most 
favourite program by Adam. She said the word. <laughs> the pig that shall not be named. Um, speaking of the children of the young, um, doing the SES news from now on, is that true? I'm, I'm very multi platform. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, you can have that pig on every channel. It wouldn't worry me. We have another question here. <laughs> She's, she snorts in her sleep. Um, just a question for broadcasters. Do you see any issues if a production company aired their content on YouTube um, and built a fan base on YouTube first and then came to the broadcasters once they've already built a fan base, like, for free on YouTube? Um, well, in the commercial free-to-air realm, we depend in a lot of respects on our classification. And like I have to, as part of my compliance with the broadcast licence, I have to put to air 390 hours of children's programming. Of that, 96 hours over three years has to be Australian children's drama. They, the regulatory body hasn't included YouTube into that area of if it went onto YouTube first, I can't claim it. We can claim it as first run, um, even subscription. If, say, Lisa had a drama and had put it to air and I decide to acquire it and put it into... ACMA for a classification. If it got a classification, I could still run it as first run because they don't class subscription as a competition in that same area as free to air television. But if Deidre showed a drama, I have to take a second run. So as far as putting it on YouTube first and it wouldn't make any difference to Is it more to attractive to you to bring a fan base along to that meeting? Oh, I think anything. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a concept a and not yeah, a finished it show, be yeah. It would as a negative to say, well, hang on, you've already been showing this stuff for free and now you're asking us to, to air it. No, no. Yeah. In, in fact, we've done something with that in terms of some Lego content on Disney XD at the moment. So, you know, it, it depends how you're going to use it, you know, in terms of that content was based around Star Wars properties. We're launching a new Star Wars um, animation show at the end of the year. So it, it's all going to form into, you know, part of our rollout plan, essentially. So, you know, and you're bringing your fans along with it. Yeah, yeah, it was something you suggested to me. And I just wanted to know if it wasn't going to be a, a silly move or something that I shouldn't have done. Because yeah. it comes down to great, great content and great characters and great storytelling, and um, you know, children are going to find it on YouTube and love it, and it ticks the boxes for for what the broadcasters will buy the content. Like it is good storytelling, it is well made, it's entertaining, and it's appropriate for the audience. Then that that's just fantastic if you've bought something that's got this great fan base. Mm. And it might also then be, I think. Um, an opportunity to even expand what you're doing with the broadcasters directly as well in terms of maybe mm. producing other content mm. around it. Offer, so. yeah. As far as taking it to the next level. Yes, yeah. that's, that's yeah. exactly, yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much. There's another question there. Uh, yes, Steve, this is directed at you. When put it together the deal for Dumpling Brothers, did you consider online as part of the overall um, strategy and overall source of funds in order to get the show made? Or was that a completely separate deal that you did with separate... Um, Broadcasters or gaming partners? No, it's all it's all sort of a holistic package that we're that we're looking at. Yeah, so they all tie in, and it's it's just it's going through those final stages, sort of now where the you know the rights lie. I mean, China's a difficult you know market, and how the um, the licensing and merchandising you know goes there, and then looking at international um, how that plays out as well. So it's it, it's going to be a difficult one to sort of sort of bring to the the final bit, but I think we're we're sort of very um, you know very close, and uh, the jury's still out. I'd probably say it, it might be that we do some gaming as a a bit of a separate you know item where we're as I said trying to get the whole television and the games you know holistically together, but. Um, if, if, if sort of the, the games comes first, we, we've decided we will sort of launch in that strategy because that will then bring the TV partners 
you forward a bit. Um, Are you getting fat advances from anybody for the game side? Uh, well, they're, they're, it's like looking to contribute to the whole yeah. funding package. Mm. So if you look at um, SNG, for example, they'll have the, the TV and also the uh, relationships out with China Mobile right. or their, their TV channels and things like that. So for them, the, the games are as attractive as the as a television, they're, they're in both of those sort of SMG's plays. Shanghai Media Group, just yeah. for everyone. Can we hear last week? Yes. Okay, um, we've, oh, we've got lots of questions there. Um, would you like this one here? Yeah? And then Wayne, you'll be the last. <laughs> Hi, um, so my question is more directed towards the producers. Um, so just from what I've seen today, I seem to see like a bit of a trend towards um, like SLR, you seem to go with more like the book kind of concept thing, whereas Liquid, uh, with your dumpling one, seems to be more of like an in-house production. Is there any uh, benefit or preference towards in-house versus like an existing content um, developed outside? Um, for, for, for me, it's always been um, that the book um, had established a marketplace. Um, and it had um, shown who the audience was and what they liked about that, and so we had something to um, to build off. But um, as I was saying before, you know, it could be from a game or it could be from you know any kind of um, area. It's just that um, it's easier to um, build a world because you put in a lot of time and money to develop something. So having a publishing partner has always been a really great model for us, but doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. Mm -hmm. And I think vice versa for us, we've naturally gone down trying to you know, create our own um, shows, but we're probably being a bit more open now to um, looking at other properties and things, but I suppose you know, right now it's still mainly in-house development of the things we, we do, but we will look at other opportunities if they, yeah. if they come along. And Wayne? Would you um, my question is across the panel as a whole. The funding's been coming tighter and tighter. The attitude of really left field style funding, you know, a lot of stuff's talking about mobile, which and the screen industry, but actually look for like social change programs and other left field government initiatives and other educational ways of educational yeah. aspects of ways of um, you know, telling our stories. I mean we're in a big country. So those sort of attitudes towards that sort of thinking both with the broadcasters and I'd be interested to know some of the left field sort of options that you've explored maybe for them that just haven't made that sort of regulatory considerations of what sort of necessary changes we need to, to lobby or make happen um, to, to make that sort of thing work better. Um, and perhaps with the producers too think that and what's beyond what's on the reach, you know, we know about mobile, we know about gaming, we know about these other things, but what's what's really left field financing that's in the next next five to ten years that can really be started for them? used to be VOD players, but it's not left field anymore, it's mainstream. No. Yeah. Um, and it used to be pay, but that's just old school now. Yeah. Um, it's, I it's reckon holographic. Yeah, I know. Like that too. <laughs> Sorry, it's an in-joke. Um, we were supposed to do research on it, and they didn't. We, we didn't have time to do research on holographic TV. Does anybody know what holographic TV is? <laughs> yeah, can someone tell us? Well, it's not supposed to be here till 2016 anyway. So. <laughs> the, the left of field, um, like, Funding can can be, you know, from I guess you're right. Everything is is here now. Um, one thing I don't think it's left to feel, but what um, we're doing is finding new territories to work with that can bring subsidies from their country. Mm. So um, we worked um, with Mexico, which, mm. um, unbeknownst to probably us and a lot of people, they have very strong um, support industry-wise and local and federal tax credits and quite a, a, a quite a um, same similar model to Australia. It's just that people aren't working with, um, with uh, Mexican companies, um, you know, didn't know about that. So that's been um, a really great thing, a find for us. Um, or, you know, reaching out to kind of different Asian territories um, and the sort of funding models there, like Astro in um, Malaysia has 180 channels, they say, um, and they all have funding models attached there. Um, that's something that's new that I'm investigating. So, 
Yeah, we're looking for countries with subsidies. New Zealand, right? <laughs> we ignore New Zealand. It's got a 40% SPIF grant now. Mm. Unbelievable. Some of the best production uh, communities in the world that we somehow mm. think two and a half hours over the Tasman is too far. And it also has blue sky arrangement with Australia. Absolutely. Well. I can yeah. still yes. count it in my yeah. quota. Yeah. It's crazy. So you can don't co -produce. Do it. Don't yeah. just produce that. <laughs> yeah, it's partnering relationships. Mm. Yeah. That's yeah. I Get think partnering and co productions and, co and looking Anything at that. I and and mm. I mean, maybe crowdfunding in three or five years becomes a viable alternative in how they look at it. I mean, we're not looking at it now, but I think if it could be, but you'd really have to have that fan base, you know, to come back to, to have people in mm. engaging in something. And it'd be a different form of content. Maybe it's a combination of shorts and games and, you know, different mm. things like that. It could be an option. Mm. Um, down, Palmer. down the track. Well, I was going to say, private equity is on the rise, particularly out of the UK. Mm -hmm. Companies mm -hmm. like Ingenious are helping to bring in private equity investors into. Uh, it's amazing, but children's content shocks me, but it delights me at the same time. Yeah. Well, I think that Ron's at the back of the the room. There, he's <laughs> found a, deep his own pockets, spot. Lots of money. Yeah. With China, so all right. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to now throw to um, the Channel Ten reel, and then um, we'll be thanking our panel. So just quickly, let's do that. These are just some of the stuff that we do in house that we're able to. Thank you very much.